Good evening and welcome to tonight's Democratic primary debate among candidates for Atlanta County Clerk. I'm John Frungin, director of the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University. We are pleased to partner with the League of Women Voters of Atlantic County to co-sponsor this forum. Now let me introduce the moderator for tonight's debate. Sharon Steinhorn is president of the Western Monmouth League of Women Voters and co-president of the Monmouth County League. She's a trained certified league moderator and has worked this past year to make virtual forums like this user friendly. So candidates, you're in good hands here. Ms. Steinhorn lives outside of Atlanta County, which is a requirement to serve as a league debate moderator. I'm sure this uh, debate will be very informative. So Ms. Steinhorn. Thank you very much, John. Good evening, viewers. I'm pleased to be your League of Women Voters moderator tonight. The League is a nonpartisan political nonprofit that works to empower voters and defend democracy. The League of Women Voters never support or oppose candidates or political parties. Founded 100 years ago, we make democracy work by protecting voting rights and encouraging robust participation. Elections and voting are core concerns for the League of Women Voters. Leagues are committed to providing fact-based information about issues and the positions candidates take on these issues, which will help voters like you make your own decisions and participate in the electoral process. Tonight, we will be meeting the two Democratic primary candidates for the office of Atlantic County County Clerk. The primary in June uh, is June 8th. The winner of this primary will be running in November for the five-year term of Atlantic County County Clerk. The candidates are here tonight to meet you, virtually of course, and to tell you their qualifications and why they're running. We will meet your candidates, Dr. Lisa Giampetti, say hi. Hello. And Miko Lukide. Hi everyone. The candidates have agreed to the following format. Each candidate has a two minute opening statement. The order of speaking tonight has been randomly decided prior to going online tonight. Each candidate will have the opportunity to answer each question. Each reply must be no longer than two minutes and we will allow one 30 second rebuttal if necessary, uh, if an opponent requests. We have a timekeeper that will hold up a yellow card when a speaker has 30 seconds left to speak, and then a red card, which tells the speaker, time is up. And I will allow them to simply finish their sentence. Our timekeeper tonight is Peggy Capone, a member of the Atlantic County League of Women Voters. And questions that I will be asking tonight have been submitted ahead of time by our sponsors and by you, the residents. The questions for tonight were chosen to avoid duplication, to offer a variety of topics, and to avoid any questions that are personal or not in the purview of the office of the county clerk. We will not be taking questions for the audience, from the audience tonight. So finally, each candidate will have two minutes for closing statement, and that order has also been chosen randomly uh, before we open tonight. And so let's get started. And with our opening statement, please. Um, and the opening statement, I think we'll go with first names. It's a little more informal and uh, we kind of got to know each other already uh, before this began. So uh, the first opening statement will be Lisa Giampetti. Lisa? Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. I would first like to thank the League of Women Voters for having me and I commend you all for your commitment to fighting voter suppression and for upholding voters rights. Just a few things about me I will share with you in two minutes or less. I have extensive background in government. I was a councilwoman in Egg Harbor City for six years. I am currently serving my third year, third term as mayor. That would be nine years. And to note, I was the first female mayor elected to Egg Harbor City. As mayor, I am the CEO of Egg Harbor City, and just 
um, to let you know, we don't have an administrator in Egg Harbor City. So I do have to assume many of those responsibilities. Um, they may be events, meeting, hiring, overseeing departments, Egg Harbor City Lake Operations, community outreach, and, and so many more. Along with that, I manage and oversee a $6 million budget in Egg Harbor City. My employment history and volunteerism throughout my life has provided me with valuable management, coordinating, directing, and administrating experience that I feel will assist me in the clerk's position if I'm fortunate enough to be elected in November. My educational background is a Bachelor of Science in Business Management from Stockton University. I have a Master's in Administrative Science from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and I recently in 2020 earned my doctorate in organizational leadership from Stockton University. I'm running for the county clerk because I think it's a great opportunity to serve my community in an expanded capacity. The county clerk is an especially important position, and I feel and I hope that you will agree that my skills, experience, and qualifications make me the best candidate for the job. I look forward to answering your questions this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And before we uh, hear, hear opening statements from Amiko, uh, I'm going to ask our timer, uh, Peggy, to turn her video on, please. There we go. Now, now we have um, a video. I'm sure that uh, Lisa did not go over her two minutes, so we'll just zoom and move on. Uh, Miko, opening statement, please. Thank you so much. First, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Hughes Center for hosting this event tonight. I would also like to thank Mayor Jim Petty for participating with me tonight. I would like to express my gratitude to any essential workers who might be viewing this debate tonight. Thank you for all you've done to keep our world moving over the past year. You deserve so much more from society and I pray that we have a deeper understanding and appreciation for what you do moving forward. My name is Miko Lukide. I'm a lifelong resident of Atlantic County. I graduated from Stockton University with a degree in political science concentrating in pre-law. I currently work as an IT professional and I'm running for county clerk. Nobody asked me to enter this race. I did it out of a passion for democracy and civic engagement. You see, the county clerk is the front line of defense for our democracy. This role is so important and I'm so thankful that the voters have an opportunity to hear from both of us tonight. I only have two minutes, so let me get down to brass tacks. In a non-presidential year, our county is lucky if we pass 38% voter turnout. That should make all of us more determined to engage with our communities. And that's exactly what I intend to do as county clerk. As county clerk, I will do outreach to communities with low voter turnout. I will make voting and election information more accessible and easy to understand for all of our voters. I will make, uh, and I will do everything in my power to give the people of Atlantic County a fairer ballot that is easier to read and meets the standards of good ballot design practices. No blank spaces, no bias design, just candidates getting equal access to the eyes of the voter. You as voters deserve a county clerk who will do more. One with a passion for civic engagement and participation, and I promise that I will be that county clerk. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Miko the first question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and here we go. Uh, an important role of the Atlantic County Clerk is administrative, involving filing and processing of records and applications in a timely manner. Uh, what administrative experience do you have that you believe uh, qualities that you have for this position? Sure, thank you. So um, I'm a, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself and I'll get into the, the meat of that question. I'm a product of my up upbringing. I grew up working poor, so I had to put a lot of effort into everything just to get by in life. Uh, the struggle for stability in an economy that doesn't care about your life experiences is a struggle that I know well. Uh, but luckily I was surrounded by a community of people who cared. When I was in college, my mother had a massive stroke and we were lucky that she survived that tragedy and I was lucky to be where I was through that tragedy. When she moved uh, to a care facility, we lost, we lost the apartment that we were living in, in Summers Point, and I was able to take out extra student loans to live on campus at Stockton. I was a curious person, so I already knew what resources were available to me. I knew how to navigate those structures to get by, but I knew that others didn't have the same privileges that I did. From that moment on, I committed myself that if nothing else, I would be a resource for people. And that decision impacted everything I would do from that moment on. I worked at Stockton for several years after graduating. 
as a research assistant for the Higher Education Strategic Information and Governance Project through the William J. Hu Center for Public Policy, as a rec records archivist for the, president, uh, for the president's office at Stockton University, proudly as a victim's advocate and LGBTQ programs assistant for the Women's Gender and Sexuality Center, and as an educational programs coordinator for the Stockton Center on Successful Aging, I left to pursue a career in IT where I oversaw a configuration of network equipment, development of troubleshooting guides. I taught and oversaw every member of the team, of my team uh, on that project. And I did it all as a temp at the time. That's my work ethic, that's my drive. My mix of experience in service management, research records, clerical technology and program coordination gives me a unique skill set to make this office more than we've ever allowed it to be. And I will be a county clerk who does more. I will exhaust myself in service to this county. So in terms of my administrative, uh, my administrative background, I've been there. I I've overseen teams, I've handled records, I've handled technology and technology is always evolving. Uh, that's the end of my time, so I'll finish that off. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, actually the same question now to Elisa. Uh, I'll repeat it for you. An important role of the Atlanta County Clerk is administrative involving filing and processing of records and applications in a timely manner. What administrative experience in, in management do you have that you believe qualifies you for this position? Well, as I said in my opening statement, I do have an extensive extensive experience in managing, directing, coordinating, and administrating. Um, I did start out my career as a Wawa manager, which I was in charge of a multi-million dollar store and had to also um, direct operations and employees and manage a budget. And obviously on a 24 hour basis because the store never closed. Also, um, as mayor, as councilwoman and mayor, I've also been responsible for many committees and, and um, running the Egg Harbor City Lake. That was a big, a big responsibility. And also as the mayor doing the same thing. And the budget, you know, the budget is not a small thing. And keeping track of um, resolutions and ordinances and things like that. Um, that's quite extensive. I've, I've also been the um, president of the Mayor's Association, and I have um, coordinated many things for that and made that organization um, better in my short time that I was the um, president. And also I was the treasurer, which is a very tedious and administrative position. And I was also privileged to serve in many the Association of Township Officials, which was an administrative position as the president, and many church, local churches as um, a coordinator, and also booster clubs, and my administrative skills as a coordinator for the after school program for eight years in a Carver City Schools. Thank you. Um, and as we had said uh, before, we were going to switch back and forth. Uh, who gets the first uh, turn at a question? So the next question is for Lisa. And uh, here we go. The clerk's office responds to numerous public records requests. What is your opinion of how the New Jersey Open Public Records Act has been implemented? And do you see any problems administering the law? Open oh, public records. I absolutely do not see any problems administrating the law. However, I can tell you firsthand that since I do have a clerk that works under me in the city, that it is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time to do it. But fortunately I have a staff that goes above and beyond the call of duty and they do get the information that people need. And I think the laws are fair both ways that they do allow enough time for the response and as long as it's not inordinately large response that some, sometimes are filed by people, I think that it's very, very doable. And I think it's a good thing for the citizens of the county and also the country to be able to get that information. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Miko, do I need to repeat the question for you? Uh, no, thank you. So the New Jersey Open Public Records Act is, uh, I have to agree with Lisa, uh, it is fair in the way that it is written. In terms of implementation, I have heard complaints from people throughout New Jersey about um, 
well, frankly, things not getting, not getting responses on time. There's a specific time limit within the law that needs to be followed. Uh, and that can sometimes be quite problematic. I understand that our county clerk typically is pretty responsive, has been uh, for his tenure at McGettigan. Uh, I intend to continue that tradition of just being timely, attentive, responsive to the people. Uh, I, I do want to say that there is something to be said. I believe, uh, I, I know that I have seen um, some issues from journalists uh, who have brought up that the New Jersey Open Public Records Act does have some limitations in terms of, I believe, executive offices or legislative offices uh, and not really being uh, open for the Open Public Records Act. So that's something that I wish would be changed. That's something that I would like to see expanded. Um, but as the county clerk, there's only so much one is able to have impact on at that sort of level. Uh, I want to just say that I acknowledge the issues inherent in um, a tighter Open Public Records Act that New Jersey has when it comes to legislative and executive uh, records like that. But uh, in terms of the Atlantic County Clerk's responsibility in this role, I mean, I'm, I'm nothing if not responsive to people. So it would be my intent to make sure that the office of the county clerk is aggressively responsive to the people in a very fast uh, and uh, complete manner. Thank you. Um, and Miku, you get the next question. Um, in, in we're going to uh, talk about voting now. The 2020, in 2020, the nation had the highest voter turnout for decades. One reason was the use of mail-in ballots. Do you support the continued use of mail-in ballots? Do you believe there should be restrictions? And if so, what might they be? So I support the use of mail-in ballots. I like what New Jersey has implemented over the years. We have a mail-in ballot system that does not require any sort of excuse. I know that in 2020, we had a broadly very successful uh, vote by mail election in the primary and in the general. Our turnout was 70%, which eclipsed the past 10 years by, by a long shot. Uh, in fact, if you, if, you do the, if you do the average, our average, uh, our average voter turnout over the past 10 years is less than 47%. And to me, that's heartbreaking. So just knowing the impact that a vote by mail election can have, um, to bring that from 47% up to 70% is inspiring to me. I would like to see New Jersey continue to move on that. I know that we're moving to other areas of access as well. We just expanded early voting. I'm, I'm assuming that might come up at some point tonight as well. Um, and all in all, when it comes down to what the county clerk does, I want to make sure that voting is as accessible as humanly possible. I want to go out into communities to make sure that they're aware of the elections that are coming up, aware of how to communicate with their government, aware of how to vote, aware of how to register with a party, aware of the county committees and the impact that they have in their communities. I want to make sure that people are connected with the resources necessary to understand their government, to understand their elections, and to be participatory. Because when we understand something, we have more trust in it, more faith in it. When we have more trust in something, we're more confident when we cast that vote. And when we cast that vote with confidence and with understanding, we have a more representative government. And that's really what this is all about to me. Thank you. Lisa, same question. Do you need me to repeat it? Well, sure, go ahead. Uh, the nation had the most, the highest voter turnout in 2020. One reason is the use of mail-in ballots. Do you support the continued use of those ballots? Do you believe there should be restrictions? And if so, what might they be? Well, after going through the 2020 election as a candidate, um, as my running for my third term as mayor, I can say I, I definitely, looking back, do support continuing to use mail-in ballots. I think it was very successful. Um, however, I do believe that people were somewhat confused because it was the first time we did it. And they really wanted to be sure, you know, I went door to door campaigning. They really wanted to be sure their vote counted and they really wanted to be sure that they were filling out the paper the voter ballot the right way. So in that respect, now that we've been through it, <clears throat> I think people feel more ease with vote by mail. I know I do. And I think that there should not really be any restrictions on it. I think that it can be done correctly. And I think it 
you know, for the most part, it was done correctly. I think Atlanta County did a great, great job with it, at least in my, my community. Um, and the only thing I think could be better is if all the municipalities have a ballot, a, um, somewhere to put their ballot, a, you know, we didn't have one in Egg Harbor City and it was a bit difficult, but now thank, thankfully the county did give us one so people can vote right in Egg Harbor City. So that was a little bit of an issue, but I think overall it's a great thing. And I think it gives people the opportunity to vote, you know, where they may not have otherwise been, been able to vote. Good, thank you. Well, can I, have, a, can I uh, have a 30 second response? You can have a 30 second, yes, sir. Thank you Go so right much. Uh, I just sort of want to also bring attention since um, Mayor Jean Petty did bring it up. There, there was an issue, there, there were a couple of issues last, last year, as we are aware, in terms of the, the, the error with um, Commissioner District 3, and that has to do with the, the state voter registration system, the SVRS. Uh, we need to make sure that we are attentive to those issues to resolve them before we end up experiencing them. We had an entire election thrown out as a result, and we need to make sure that that is, you know, that that is removed from the equation. Uh, in addition to that, I do know that the state also just recently you're, passed a law giving, was that my 30 you're, seconds? Your oh, 30 seconds, your 30 seconds is up, but we're going to actually come to a question um, that may give you the opportunity to elaborate on that. Um, but we're going back to Lisa and actually you started talking about the uh, opportunity about drop boxes. And so the next question is the use of drop boxes has increased. Do you support the use of the guidelines used by the state in 2020? Uh, in the 2020 election? And if so, do you support the legislation being uh, codified into law? If not, why? Well, ab absolutely, because if we're going to, God forbid, if we have another um, pandemic like we had, we have to have laws that guide and direct us. And we have to have the ballots or the drop boxes placed in the right places. Um, you know, it's, it's only fair to the voters that they get the same um, chance to vote as any other community. You know, why should my voters in Egg Harbor City have to go to Mays Landing to drop off their ballot when an Apsekin resident can go right to, you know, the ballot box and drop their ballot in? So yeah, I think that I definitely support anything that that promotes utilizing the facilities we have in the event that it goes to that again. Okay, thank you. And uh, Miko, drop boxes. <clears throat> you want me so, to ask the question again? Uh, I think I got it, thank you. Okay. So um, 2020, there were a few issues in terms of drop boxes as we saw in Egg Harbor City, for example. Uh, throughout the state, I have heard of several issues pop up, especially in densely populated areas, but New Jersey did just recently pass a law uh, that allows for board uh, the board of elections to make better uh, to make different determinations in terms of where ballot boxes can be located if there are you know populations that are absent from a a, a ballot drop box. So I support the the way that this is going. I support the use of ballot drop boxes. I think that it's a safe, secure way for people to deliver their mail in uh, their mail in ballots if they decide to vote by mail. I also like what else New Jersey is doing with early voting. Uh, you know, it's, and just to be clear for everyone who, who doesn't know, New Jersey will have early voting for the general election this year and moving forward every primary and general after that. There's a different amount of days depending on the type of election that's going on that year, um, but that's something that we need to be aware of. For this primary, it will not be early voting and we will not be using the new voting systems that are out there that were tested recently, the ESR, uh, the ES and S. Uh, election systems and software that was tested on April 20th for the Buena Vista election. Uh, we will not be using that for this primary, but it's still being talked about for the general election. I want to make sure that the county clerk's office is working in coordination with the superintendent of elections and board of elections to make sure that our elections are as successful as possible and to make sure that people are aware of all of the different ways of voting that they have access to. And I think that ballot drop boxes are absolutely an important piece of that. Thank you. Um, and uh, next question, back to staying with you, Miko. Um, the 2020, 2020 election was filled with accusations of fraud. 
A common thread in those accusations were partisan pressure. Should this happen in Atlantic County, how would you be able to manage the political pressure? So I am <laughs> political pressure. That's that's an interesting uh, thing to bring up. Um, I, I'm going to be frank. I'm in this race as a candidate from the outside. You know, I, I'm experiencing political pressure to uh, to leave this race, to stay in this race. I'm not one to give up to, to give into any sort of pressure uh, if doing what's right is on the line. Uh, one of the things that I think I'm very passionate about and very um, you know, one of the things that I hope to accomplish through the clerk's office is making sure that people have access to this information so that when people bring these issues of partis these partisan accusations up, we can pull out the information right there. No, that is not true. This is exactly what happened. No, that's not true. This is how the Board of Elections counts their votes. In the 2020 election between Election Day and when Joe Biden was finally declared president, we saw across the country people say screaming to keep voting, people screaming to stop the vote, people who didn't understand what a provisional ballot was and why it was getting counted last. That is something that tore me up. And that's really what drove me to jump into this race on December 14th. When it comes down to it, we are not doing a good enough job in our society to make sure that people understand our elections and are informed about how our voting process works. That is something that I will change as county clerk. And I love the work that the League of Women Voters is doing to make sure that people are educated but we also need, this is a, a multi-pronged approach to making sure that people are informed uh, and have the resources that they need to be participatory in their democracy. Thank you. And Lisa, Lisa same question. How would you be able to manage the political pressure? Oh, you're muted, Lisa. Gotcha. Okay. Well, first of all, my life is political pressure. I know what that feels like. Um, I do find that there are ways to mitigate that, uh, especially paying attention to detail, things like making sure that the voters feel secure, making sure the ballots are correct, making sure that they have the information that they need to complete the ballot. And just that alone could prevent a lot of backlash. You're always gonna have people that complain for political purposes or try to um, spin things for political reasons. But I think that there are safeguards that can be employed. One, one thing especially that sticks out in my mind is to make sure that all the signatures are checked on the ballots. I know that was an important um, point for some of the people that I spoke to when I was going out campaigning. They, they were afraid that maybe their signature wasn't going to match or whatever. So I really think communication and education can be done to prevent some of that political backlash, but you're never going to get away from politics and political backlash. It's just the nature of the beast. Okay. Thank you. Can I respond? Uh, Did I get 30 seconds? I'm sorry that I'm doing this again. <laughs> um, can you hold, can you hold off? Let's get a couple of more voting questions in right. and uh, maybe what your comment will, will, you know, get covered. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, with Lisa first, uh, let's talk voting security. Um, what is the state of your county's voting machines? Do they supply a paper trail and or uh, are the results auditable? Well, I can speak for what I know about Egg Harbor City. We, um, I'm always there on election night at, at the uh, clerk's off at my clerk's office, and we do get printouts of the ballots and they are recorded. Um, we haven't had any problems in Egg Harbor City, and I, 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 I like the ballot machines. I think they're efficient, if effective, and um, they should be public record and people should be able to get the results. And we always, we always get the results election night before anybody else does. So I think that that speaks volumes to what, you know, our, our system is right now. Okay. Miko, same question. Uh, <clears throat> the state of the county's voting machines, do they supply a paper trail uh, and or uh, the result, are the results auditable? What do you know about them? So I am uh, glad to say that I've worked as an area leader for uh, on election day in the past. And 
Uh, I got personal first hands-on experience with some of these voting machines that we currently use. These ones that we currently use are not going to be sufficient moving forward under New Jersey's new early voting law, and there will be a transition to a more modern system. Uh, and as I said before, the ESNS, the election systems and software equipment, was tested on April 20th. That one provides a paper ballot. That one provides a paper receipt for their uh, for the voters. Um, the current machines that we have does not provide a paper receipt to the voter. What it does have is a, a printout list uh, of all of the votes that have been cast on that machine. They are zeroed out. You know, I, I remember going through the uh, going through the superintendent superintendent of elections office, or rather the warehouse where they keep all of those machines and see them get zeroed out to make sure that all of the ballots were correct on them and to show that the printout is, you know, starts out at zero so that everyone starts off, you know, with no votes, clearly. Um, one of the things that I want to say about that is it is auditable in some respects and ultimately the Board of Elections is um, involved in making sure that our ballots are all counted correctly. And that was one of the, that was what I did want to say earlier. In terms of the signatures, uh, if I could just call back to that for a moment, I know that that is a concern that some people have had. I know that during the election last year, the Board of Elections did an amazing job at making sure that there was a completely transparent process, but a lot of people did not know about it. You could go to the Board of Elections website and actually watch them going through the signatures. You could see the signatures, see them comparing the signatures, voting on whether the signature counted or was valid or not. Um, so it's stuff like that that I think we need to keep doing, make it accessible to people. And I do want to see a transition to these new systems that provide a paper receipt for every voter. Thank you. Glad you got in what you wanted to add before. Um, and this question goes to you again, Miko. <clears throat> Miko. Um, how are the positions of the party candidates determined on the ballot? Do the positions vary from year to year or are they fixed? Should the system be changed? And if so, how? Oh boy, okay, we're going there. Um, so New Jersey has a very unique ballot. New Jersey is the only state that uses this county line style of ballot where candidates are bracketed together in columns. Uh, it is frankly an unfair system. We saw a study done by Julia Sass Rubin, professor at the Blaustein School of Public Policy that uh, determined that a county line ballot structure can give the person on that county line the, a, a up to, uh, an average of a 35% point advantage just by having that position on the ballot. They start out 35 points ahead of whatever candidate could be challenging them from a different column. The current structure that we have is a bit nonsensical, I have to say. The candidates that get what is called the county line, which is the single bracketed column of endorsed candidates from the county party in a primary election, is they're chosen uh, at, here in Atlanta County at a county convention. Uh, the county committee members elected by the party get to vote on who that candidate is to appear in that ballot, to, to appear in that ballot line. And everybody else, you have to either decide to bracket with someone at a county level, Senate level, or gubernatorial level, um, or you are just pushed out to the next line out. It doesn't matter if you're. It doesn't matter if there's blank space on the ballot. It doesn't matter if you know you want to bracket with someone on a lower column uh, on a lower race than you. If you're a mayor and you want to run with you know a member of uh, a member of council, but you don't have someone running at the county level with you, that can cause other issues. Another thing that comes up is it's. It's practiced differently from county to county. The county clerk has an impact on how these ballots end up getting drawn. For example, I thought that I wasn't going to be in column A. I'm in column A this year. I thought that Governor Murphy was going to have column A automatically because he's the gubernatorial candidate. And every other county said, no, we go straight with a gubernatorial candidate. He is the only one, he gets column A. So I ended up in column A because the county clerk decided to draw by the contested races in those elections. This is something that is uncommon and yeah. unusual. Thank you for finishing the sentence. Um, Lisa, want to try to uh, tackle the, uh, the county line. Uh, how are the positions of the candidates determined? And uh, should the system be fixed, changed? If so, how? Well, I've been, I've been running for, I've been in politics for 15 years and I've, I've had many elections and the way that I've known that a person gets the line is their party support. 
So, I mean, it's kind of obvious the Democrats meet and, you know, whoever's running gets to do their spiel and, and the Democrat, you know, committee, the Atlanta County Democrats pick who they want for the line. And that's usually the way it works. Um, I did have an issue one year where I did have a, a, a person in the primary who ran against me and neither of us were given the line. And that was a decision, you know, that was made by the um, chairperson of the Atlanta County Democrats. But the position, you know, may, maybe we were on D or C, I can't recall at the time, but that was also a lottery where your name was put in the hat and it was drawn for which gets the first line. And, and in this case, in the primary, Miko has line A and I have line B. Now I'm on the line with the rest of the Democrats that were chosen by the Atlanta County Democrats. So it's, it seems like um, it's, a it's a decision that is really, a, really large and it's not really one person, you know, one sole person to say what goes for hundreds of thousands. However, I think that, you know, our system has been working pretty well for the most part. So, I mean, if uh, that's, that's my position on it. Okay, thank you. Um, you both mentioned- respond? My name was mentioned, can I respond? You went, you, yes, go ahead, 30 so, seconds. This is something that is, like I was saying before, unusual. Different counties do it differently, and not every county does have a nominating process. Here in Atlantic County, yes, the parties do have a nominating process where everybody gets their vote. In some counties, it is literally just one person deciding. It is a county chair making that determination for who ends up on that ballot line. That is not fair. We have a fairer process here in New Jersey, but ultimately that ballot is still not giving equal access to the eyes of the voters for every candidate on that ballot. This is something that, in my opinion, we should change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, you both mentioned something about making sure that voters know all about voting. Um, so if you were the county clerk, uh, what would you be doing to educate voters about online registration? Uh, this one goes to Lisa. Well, this is something I deal with every single year as a mayor, not only as a candidate, but, but for my candidates, I reach out to many people. I have a lot of stakeholders and I have made a lot of friends and um, of different groups in Egg Harbor City, such as the Coalition for a Safe Community, Pastors United for Community Service. I have um, representatives from different, different areas in our community that go out and they educate people on how to vote, when to vote, where to vote, and I think it's, it's really just a matter of education. As a clerk, I would personally like to reach out to schools and um, county, county clerks and see if we can do voter registrations and things like that. And, you know, do, do more public outreach because I really think it's necessary. And just, I can tell you honestly that People do not know how to vote. They do are not familiar with the election process because I've talked to so many voters and they're very confused. Some people don't know if they can vote in the primary, if they can't vote in a primary. There's just so much information that has to really get out to the public. And I want to make the clerk's office an extension of the community and be there for them. Miko, same question. Can you repeat the question for me? Please? Sure. Basically, what would you be? What would you do uh, to further educate voters about online registration, specifically? So this is something that I've been talking about since I launched my campaign back in December. Uh, doing outreach to communities is really central to what I want to do as county clerk. Um, I intend to do an audit uh, for the over the past five years. When I when I get elected county clerk, I intend to do an audit of the last five years of elections to see which communities have downtrending voter turnout or low voter turnout in general under 30%, which unfortunately is, is quite a few. In fact, in communities of color in Atlantic County, uh, they typically have a voter turnout that is 14, as much as 14% less than uh, the next, uh, than the next, um, than the average, I'm sorry, than the average voter turnout for that cycle, up to 34% lower than the highest turnout town. That is something that I think needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of online voter registration specifically, 
It is something that I'm so proud of New Jersey to have passed, and I'm so glad that we have access to this. I want to make sure that people have access to this directly. Going out into communities that have low voter turnout, going to their public events, going to their community events, having, uh, having seminars in those towns and making sure that people are invited out, that community groups are invited out, making those connections to make sure that they have this information is important. Having resources at those tables with those you know, laptops set up so that people can automatically just like go on in and get registered to vote in addition to having those paper forms available, I think is incredibly important. Um, we are not doing enough to reach um, Spanish speaking community in our county. That's something that we need to focus on as well. There are people in our county who don't speak English. We need to make sure that they have access to this information as well. We also need to have a presence on social media, have a presence in our community. We need to be visible. Visibility is key when you're trying to reach voters. That's what we need from the county clerk's office. And that's what I'm going to do. Not just be visible, but also make sure that our voters understand how to vote and that their voice matters in every vote they count. They Thank cast, you. I'm sorry, they cast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Miko, this question comes to you. Um, the laws regarding, regarding primaries in New Jersey have made it difficult for registered independent voters to vote, obviously in primaries. In fact, approximately one third registered voters in Atlanta County are registered as independents. So for a primary election, the disenfranchisement of registered independent voters uh, could be solved by instituting open primaries. Is this something you are willing to promote? And how would you do it? This is something that I am willing to promote. I am, and, and this may lose me some people out there during a the primary race, I support open primaries. I support as many people being able to have their, their voice heard as possible. And in the uh, two-party system that we have, frankly, in our, in our country, leaving out voters who don't decide to affiliate with that party really puts them at a disadvantage even in the general election when they cast their ballots. I think that what we need to do, I think that what I could do as county clerk is just be visible and be a voice in those communities to make sure that voters are aware of the limitations of our current democracy and ways that people could change that. The position of the county clerk is not a policy position. It is not one through which I can accomplish that change, but I will not be shy about voicing the fact that frankly, our democracy is not as small D democratic as it could be. And it's up to the voters to make sure that the people in positions of power are listening to them when they call for open primaries, when they call for early voting, when they call for a better ballot, when they call for any of these things to make our, to make our community you know, more representative. That's ultimately what the goal of anyone in this position should be, to make sure that people are heard and to make sure that, they're, uh, that their elected officials are representative of their concerns. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, same question. Well, it is, it is kind of sad that I think, in, in my opinion, the people don't know if they're independent, whether they can vote or not. I think that's really the problem that we're speaking of, because people can go to the polls and vote if they declare. Now, if you declare in a primary, okay, that's if you like a candidate, a particular candidate that you like, and you declare in a primary, you're certainly free to vote for any other candidate you want in the general election even if you have declared, just declaring maybe possibly you want to vote for a Democratic candidate in the primary, you could still vote for Republican candidates in the um, general election. However, I guess the ones that are not on the party line, or as uh, we spoke of before, the voters would be disenfranchised, then they would not be, unless they wanted to, you know, be that party that whatever other parties might be on the right hand side of the line down the end. But um, I, I support, you know, not, you know, letting people vote in the primaries. And I think that our laws now sort of allow for that in a way, because like I said, you can still vote for whoever you want in the general election, if you like a particular candidate in the primary. And then you always have the option to go back to unaffiliated 
if you so choose. It doesn't stop you from voting in the pro in the general election either. And I, 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 I'm, I'm running out of time, so I won't speak any more on that, but that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. And Lisa, here's, uh, you get this next question first. Um, uh, and it was uh, alluded to earlier in the evening. Uh, the New Jersey County clerks included in your own board of election, including, sorry, including your own board of elections chairsperson has recently voiced concerns to the state regarding the voter, the state voter registration database. They have stated that the unresolved issues with this system will negatively affect the new electronic poll books. In your opinion, what steps are necessary to begin to address both issues? Uh, this is Lisa first. Well, that, that certainly was a problem. Obviously it had it had huge ramifications in Atlanta County this year. Apparently that was part of the reason why there was some mistakes made in the, in the um, last election. And I would be a, a, I can tell you personally from looking at my registered voters in Egg Harbor City, there are a lot of inconsistencies. There are people that were on my, um, my roles that ha haven't lived in a Harbor city in years, several of them had died, but you know, it's an ongoing problem that really requires a lot of communication, not only between the board of elections, but also the people that, you know, have, have changed their addresses and things like that. Once again, it goes back to communication. They don't really know that if they do get that ballot in the mail, that it has to go to the board in order to get that corrected and they will be issued a new ballot. Now on the state level, that's a, that's a huge, huge task. And I would certainly be an advocate to do whatever I can do as a clerk to help correct that situation because truly it is, it is a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Miko? Yes, can you uh, repeat the question for me? You bet, certainly. Um, New Jersey County clerks, including your own Board of Elections chairperson, have recently voiced concerns to the state regarding the state voter registration database. They've stated that the unresolved issues with that system will negatively affect the use of electronic poll books. Uh, so in your opinion, what steps are necessary to begin to address this issue? So I do come from an IT background and I know what it means when systems can't really communicate with each other properly. We do have a bit of an archaic system when it comes to our, uh, the, the SVRS, the state voter registration system. That is something that the state level does need to make sure is addressed um, to be sort of brought up to code, brought up to standard. Uh, I know that uh, this was kind of jumbled in with, I say jumbled in with, this was properly included with the early voting legislation that passed earlier this year, um, which according to the Association of Counties, this is gonna cost a lot of money. It's gonna cost uh, up to $77 million, which is you know, way more than the governor has proposed in his budget this year. That's something that we need to be mindful of. We need to make sure that this is not an underfunded mandate because it's going to take uh, man and woman power to make sure that our systems are up to speed with these new, um, the ES and S systems that we may be using moving forward. The electronic poll books in particular is you know, something uh, very important to make sure is properly connected, but also we need to make sure that um, as it has been mentioned, communication, not just with the voters, but among the election officials. We have a superintendent of elections that is responsible as the registrar essentially of elections to make sure that our, voting, that our voter data is up to speed, up to date. Um, and that includes people moving, that includes people um, you know, passing away to make sure that they are removed from those poll books. We need to make sure that all of our election officials are in communication with every election, deep communication, not just like passive crossing the street, you know, hey, is this going on? This is going on, okay. But really sincere efforts to make sure that every vote is counted, to make sure that every vote matters and to make sure that every voter can feel confident that their vote was counted. Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming towards the end. Um, this isn't the last question, but I'd like to go back to management of uh, as the cl county clerk. Um, as the county clerk, you'd be managing many people. 
Uh, how would you describe your management style? Can you give an example of a tough personnel problem without mentioning names, of course, and how it was managed successfully? Uh, and that's gonna go to Miko first. Sure. Um, so uh, I believe the county clerk's office, if I remember correctly, when I last checked, is about 29 people. Um, and it's split between two offices because there's an office in Atlantic City that frankly is underutilized and that's something I want to change too. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, when it comes to my management style, um, I'm sort of a product of my generation. I am uh, a millennial. So there's something to be said for the approach that I take. I take a sincere and personal approach and make sure that the person, the, the people that are working under me know that they are supported by me as their manager. I also make sure that they are aware of their expectations, my expectations for them. And I make clear when something is sort of set in stone that it is set in stone and that they must be responsive to that. You know, I could go into specifics of personal per personnel uh, issues that I've, uh, that I've dealt with. Some of them might be watching tonight. That might be a little uncomfortable. But uh, there have been issues where, say, uh, someone under me has not necessarily been responsive uh, to requests that I have made. And that's something that I've had to work around. I've had to make sure that uh, I try different methods of communications to reach them. But also there have been issues where people have not been doing the thing that I asked them to do. And they've been sort of toying with their approach to it. So making sure that clarity is, uh, more or less clarity is key when it comes to uh, any sort of management. Making sure that people understand that they are expected not just to be uh, on top of their responsibility, but to do it in the way that is asked of them. Uh, clarity is something that I take very seriously when it comes to these things. I work in, uh, I've worked in troubleshooting for several years. So if I'm not absolutely clear and crystal about the shape of the thing that they're supposed to be working with, you know, it could fly off the handle. So clarity is something that I think is key to any manager. And also just, as I said before, making sure that expe expectations are stated from start to finish. Thank you. Um, Lisa, question, management style and any tough situation you've handled? Yes, I'm basically a hands-on <clears throat> type of manager and I am a participatory manager and leader. My people know that I'm with them and I will roll up my sleeves and do what it, what it takes to get the job done with them, side by side with them. I treat everyone with respect, the respect and dignity that they deserve as employees. I have had many issues that had to be resolved in Egg Harbor City and I'm not certainly going to reveal all of those specifically, but I can tell you that updating policies and procedures and um, creating updated personnel manuals and communication with employees goes a long way into solving some of those problems. And specifically, giving people what they need to do their job is very important. A lot of times in our um, municipalities, we don't have the money to, to fund some of the departments that we have. And you know it causes problems. It's not necessarily the employees' problems. But um, there are ways to go about solving problems that do not degrade an employee, but takes them, you take them under your wing and try to correct the situation and get the um, support of the whole organization to change problems and get their opinion as to what, what things need to be changed. And I think that if everyone works together as a team in an organization, I think those problems um, become a lot smaller. Great, thank you. And um, this is the last question before you have an opportunity for your two minute closings. Um, this is gonna go first to Lisa. Um, and um, I love this question. I've never seen it before in all the, all the forums I've done. Uh, and just because we're nearing the end, let's try to do this in one minute. I'll confuse the poor timekeeper, but <laughs> um, it, here's the question. Should you prevail in the primary, what will your path to victory look like towards November? Okay, so I, like, I hate to keep saying it, but I've been through many elections and you know what, the most important thing that I found that 
is a path to victory is to really get out there and talk to people, communicate with people, get to know people, let them get to know you. People are so appreciative that you stop by their house or you, you know, talk to them that it really makes a difference. I can, I can tell you assuredly that public outreach will be hopefully one of the things I use to, for my path to victory. Okay, thank you. And Miko, same question. Absolutely. I, I have to say, you know, whoever wins in this primary, we are going to be up a we are going to be up against a Hamilton Republican in the general election. So that's going to take some absolute tenacity and work ethic to make sure that we are able to uh, overcome that obstacle. So uh, I've already been out there. You know, uh, this this is a primary. I'm taking it absolutely serious. Uh, I and my team have been out there meeting with voters, going to community events already, making sure that we're knocking on doors and taking sincere approaches to voters' interests and curiosities. A lot of people don't know what the county clerk does. They'll, first question they'll ask me, well, what does the county clerk do? My response is clearly not enough if you have to ask that question. So I'm, I'm uh, kind of echoing that sense of absolutely meeting with voters, being present now, getting out there now, going to those community events, making sure that people see you now and will remember you when that general election comes around is vital and so important. And I intend, I intend to continue that past the primary because once I'm county clerk, I'm going to be in the community every chance that I get when I'm not busy with other responsibilities of the clerk. Thank you. Okay, nicely done. Uh, it takes us to the closing statements. And uh, once again, as we randomly did a pick, uh, Lisa got first, first pick on closing statements as she did for opening. So Lisa, your two minute closing, please. Well, once again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight. Um, I hope that you've gotten to know me a little bit better, and I really do appreciate the very, um, the very wonderful questions that were, were given by people. It's, it's really great that people participated. I do believe that my experience, skills, and education do make me the best candidate for the Atlantic County Clerk's position. I have had I have the ability to connect and work well with people. That's a much needed skill for a county clerk. You can't just get things done by yourself. You need people to do that. Um, I've been honored to be endorsed by Governor Phil Murphy, Sheriff Eric Scheffler, and Assemblyman Vince Mazio. I was unanimously endorsed by the Atlanta County Democrats Nominating Committee, and I won the Atlanta County Democrat Convention by two to one margin. I would certainly be honored if the League of Women Voters would endorse me for county clerk. Thank you. And I would like you to know also that I'm here even after this meeting. Um, you all have my contact. Please call me and feel free to email me or text me, whatever, if you have any further questions that weren't answered this evening. Thank you. Uh, and uh, before uh, I give Miko the chance to answer uh, to give his two minutes. I just have to say that uh, the League of Women Voters does not endorse or support any candidates. We are nonpartisan and uh, our job is just to let the people see you. And we're glad you chose to join us tonight uh, for both of you. But um, I just wanted to make it clear that um, our endorsement, uh, it doesn't happen <laughs> to anybody. And so Miko, two minute closing, please. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters and the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy for hosting tonight. Again, thank you, Mayor Jean Petty, for sharing your time with us tonight. And thank you, voters who took time out of your, you know, Tuesday night where you could have been doing anything else to just get a little bit engaged with some of your local candidates. It's so important to make sure that you're connected and tuned in to what's going on. I'm always thrilled when our message is able to reach more people. You know, the role of county clerk, in my view, is underutilized. And that's something that we need to change. If we elect somebody with passion, work ethic, drive, and sincere small d democratic values, we could make Atlanta County Clerk, Atlanta County's clerk office something that the county can take pride in. I've mentioned multiple times tonight, if, if chosen as county clerk, I'm going to be on the community every, every chance that I get. I'm going to be making sure that our voters are informed uh, and connected with the resources that they need to be participatory in that democracy. You know. I, I take this extremely seriously. 
Uh, and it's, it's shown by the people who have, you know, put their support behind me as well. I have been endorsed by Ashley Bennett, by Susan Corngut. I just uh, today received an endorsement from Victory Fund, which is a national organization. I also have the support of Our Revolution's national organization. I have the support of South Jersey Progressive Democrats, the Good Government Coalition in New Jersey. You know, this is the company that I keep. These are the people who are behind me and my message. This is what I want to bring to the county clerk's office. The Good Government Coalition uh, and the, the values behind that really match up so appropriately with what the county clerk can do if we give ourselves a county clerk who wants to. This is not a do nothing job and it can be so much more than we've let it be in the past. And I intend to be a county clerk that does more. Thank you. Um, so I wanna thank a number of people. Uh, first to Victoria uh, Druding from the Atlantic County League of Women Voters um, for working on this program with us. Uh, I wanna thank John Frugin from the, and the team at the Hughes, Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University. Uh, and certainly uh, the, all of you who have registered and are on watching tonight. Uh, and most, most appropriately, thank you to the candidates, uh, to Dr. Lisa uh, Giampetti and to Miko Lukide uh, for their willingness to run for public office and to serve and to be here with us tonight. Uh, so before we sign off, John, uh, you're going to, I believe, uh, tell the viewers how they can see this uh, and don't forget to get to the polls on June 8th. So John, I turn over the last closing remark to you. Thank you. And I, I just want to congratulate both candidates for a very substantive and civil debate. So uh, congratulations. I thank you for being here. And I thank the League of Women Voters for making this debate possible. A video recording of this debate will be posted and archived on the Hughes Center website. And you can find us at www.stockton.edu slash Hughes Center. Thank you and good night. Good night.